Okay, so yeah, uh, I'm, uh, I'm Miles Sibley. Um, I've been uh, wondering how to uh, introduce myself because um, I've just changed jobs. Uh, a few weeks ago, I took up the post of Executive Director for Healthwatch uh, in Devon. Uh, now, some of you might be wondering what on earth Healthwatch is. Uh, other people might be uh, thinking, well, uh, what does a health sector person know about environment and community engagement in environmental issues? So the answer to that is that, uh, okay, so previously there was problems with that, now it's problems with the sound. Okay, so I hope you can hear me. Um, yeah, so prior to taking up this new job, I spent 18 years working with the conservation uh, volunteers, um, most recently as their director of strategy. And it was in that capacity that I had the opportunity about a year or so ago uh, to contribute to, to, to this report, the Carnegie report, which you've all got in your bags, um, Pride in Place, Tackling Environmental Incivilities. Uh, but I haven't come here to talk to you about my uh, professional credentials. I actually want to talk to you about my dog. Uh, this is Lady, uh, uh, a Jack Russell, as you can see, small dog, big attitude. Um, can I just ask, do we have any other dog owners here? Can I have a hands up from any, yay, out and proud, the dog owners in the audience? <laughs> okay, well, whether we're dog owners or not, uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with this old friend. Uh, now, you could be forgiven for thinking that this is a dog turd, but actually it's not. This is an environmental incivility. Uh, so any parents here, next time you're in the park with your kids, remember to tell them don't step in any environmental incivilities. Uh, but the thing is, uh, even though a dog turd is an environmental incivility, that doesn't mean that an environmental incivility is always a dog turd. Uh, <laughs> The term environmental incivility is taken from a definition of antisocial behavior uh, that was produced by the Home Office in 2004. Um, that definition described four subsets of antisocial behavior, uh, one of which was environmental damage or incivility, with examples given as uh, graffiti, vandalism, rubbish, and litter. And the word incivility, by the way, uh, is defined as uh, an uncivil or discourteous Act. So an environmental incivility is an act of rudeness or discourtesy that you come across outdoors in the environment as opposed to, I don't know, in the workplace or uh, at a dinner party or whatever. So we're talking about things like this uh, or this. Uh, and by the way, I'm sorry if this one here causes offence, uh, but that's kind of the point of an uncivil or discourteous act. That's what it's meant to do. Uh, and as, uh, of course, as we've just seen, environmental incivility also encompasses this. Uh, uh, and the thing is, I'm sure all the dog owners here are extremely responsible and pick up after their dogs or when they take them for a walk. Personally, I look forward to the day when we see this. Because, yeah, <laughs> what about the dogs taking some responsibility? But until the day we see this happening, uh, dog mess is probably going to remain at the top of the league table of environmental incivilities. It's reckoned that members of parliament get more complaints about dog mess uh, than pretty much anything else. And I know uh, from first-hand experience uh, that some of those MPs uh, and indeed quite a few civil servants and local authority staff get quite fed up with the amount of time that they have to spend on dealing with complaints about dog mess. Uh, and the way I've heard that expressed is something along the lines of, well, you know, haven't people got anything more important to worry about? So that's what I want to address, um, is the question of why people in a world that is beset with huge problems, uh, economic recession, uh, immense pressure on the NHS, climate change, and so on, uh, why do they spend all their time whinging about dog mess instead of getting angry and active on the things that really matter. Because what those MPs and local authority staff and so on say is actually true. 
Uh, it's true that far more people get worked up about the appearance of their neighborhood than the state of the planet. And, and that's what this report, Pride in Place, uh, is all about. Why do people get so wound up about environmental incivilities, and what can we do about that? I, I think that to answer that question, um, one of the first things we have to ask is, what do we mean when we talk about environment and people's, intre people's interest and engagement in environmental issues? And that's a really important question, because very often people think environment means rainforests and saving the whale and habitat and species and all that kind of stuff. Actually, it doesn't. Uh, environment is first and foremost the place where you live. It's what you see when you step out of your front door. It's what you experience when you walk down the street. So if your environment is full of litter and graffiti, if it looks rubbish, how do you think that's going to make you feel? It's probably going to make you feel rubbish. Uh, and if your environment looks unsafe, you'll feel unsafe. And if it looks uncared for, then maybe you're going to feel that the powers that be don't care very much about you either. And this matters because we know that people's immediate environment has a profound effect on their state of mind and their general well-being. So if, as we see here, uh, environmental incivilities are a significant predictor of distress, why do we tend to write off people who complain about dog mess? Why do we see their concerns as trivial? Because we do. It's an unhappy fact that policymakers just don't see the importance of these kinds of things. Now, uh, maybe policymakers have their minds on higher things, the economy, the state of the NHS, and so on. But perhaps they should be thinking a bit more about environmental incivilities. Because you could argue that the level of environmental incivilities in a neighborhood could be treated in a similar way to an indicator species in a certain type of habitat. Um, so I'm guessing that in this audience, many of us will be familiar uh, with the idea that the health and prevalence of some species within certain ecosystems uh, can be used as a general indication of the overall health uh, of the whole ecosystem. So lichen on trees uh, tends to indicate good air quality uh, and uh, the likelihood of a rich biodiversity within a woodland. Mayfly larvae can do the same for water quality uh, and the general health of freshwater species and systems. So perhaps policymakers should be thinking about the fact that a high prevalence of vandalism and graffiti and litter in local area probably indicates a poor state of local economy with a depressive effect on house prices and a reluctance by employers to locate and invest. Maybe they, they should think about the fact that a, uh, a, a neglected park, one that feels unsafe to be in, probably indicates a, a low incidence of physical exercise, uh, a corresponding increase in sedentary lifestyles, and a source of pressure on the NHS. And crucially, maybe they should also be thinking about the fact that a high level of complaint about things like dog mess could indicate that there are people in that community, in that neighborhood, who are concerned enough to want to be doing something about that. Because let's be clear about one thing. When it comes to environmental incivilities, it's very easy to jump to conclusions, to make lazy judgments, and to end up blaming the victims. You know, the old thing about, well, what do you expect from, about, from people from that area? They always shit on their own doorstep. I'm willing to bet that the people in those houses did not put that rubbish there. And lazy thinking extends beyond that. We know that the poorest communities always experience the worst quality environments. So areas with the worst environmental incivilities tend to be the poorest areas, and we also know that poor neighborhoods tend to be quite ethnically and culturally mixed. So then you get the one about, oh yeah, but you can't get people in that area to get involved and do anything about it because they don't have a culture of volunteering. 
uh, wrong. Um, wrong not just because that's a kind of empty-headed prejudice, but also because it's factually wrong. Another one is people in poorer areas won't look after their parks and green spaces because they're not interested in the environment. Well, wrong again. People do care about the places where they live and work. They do want better quality local environments, and they do want to be involved in that process. OK, I'm getting warnings about time here, so um, what I'm going to do is leave you with a couple of case studies which I think demonstrate that environmental instabilities, precisely because they're such a blight on people's lives, can also be a fantastic catalyst uh, for action. So a few years ago, uh, in the Conservation Volunteers, we ran a project in Moss Side in Manchester. And one of the residents there was a guy called Washington Alcott. And he described a space at the back of a couple of rows of terraced houses which had been derelict and polluted for 30 years. Uh, and this is a, a, a slide uh, he showed in a little presentation uh, that he did. So Washington's story was that for 30 years, local residents had been trying to get something done about this local eyesore and health hazard. And finally, what happened was that we got them a grant. And with that and a little bit of practical support, they turned this rubbish-strewn back alley into a little community garden, a little bit of urban green space. So that's community environmental action catalyzed by filth. A couple of years after that, we ran another project over in Wakefield, and this one was led by uh, young people, and specifically a group of young Muslims from the Pakistani community. And the real movers and shakers were a group of lads who were absolutely mad keen on cricket. Uh, and right on their doorstep, they had some playing fields that, that had been locked up for 14 years because of a legal wrangle between the local council and the landowner. Now, 14 years is a whole generation of young people denied access to green space. And again, a relatively small grant, some legal advice, uh, a bit of practical assistance, got those young people back into that green space, improving it for themselves and their community. And the very first thing they did was a huge litter pick because over that period, the place had uh, turned into an eyesore. So I'll just finish off by saying that this is not a dog turd. It need not be an environmental incivility. It could be a catalyst uh, for action, an engagement opportunity. Because most people in most places do want better places. The goodwill is there, and it's not that hard to release it. Thank you.